Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be discussing what we can expect from a new Labour government in terms of its relations with Israel and the Jewish people. Warm well, welcome to, to the programme and I have uh, two special guests, they're both from London. My, my first guest is Jerry Lewis from Khan Israel Public Radio and he's the UK correspondent. Welcome to the programme Jerry. Uh, together with uh, Pastor Jonathan Croft from the International Christian MC at Jerusalem UK. So welcome to the programme. Uh, Jerry, it's been such a while since uh, you've been on the Middle East port so it's an absolute privilege to have you back to really uh, uh, question you regarding your expertise on uh, British politics and particularly this uh, new government that's been elected on Thursday the 4th of July with a huge mandate. So we'll be asking what is the Labour position on Israel and uh, the Jewish people. But do you want to just remind our viewers and myself of the incredible work that you've been doing for Israel uh, over the decades on reporting on the latest developments in Parliament as it affects Israel? Well, I've tried to convey to British viewers on BBC, ITV and Sky, and I used to appear a lot, what Israel was doing and why it was doing, not to defend it so much as to explain. But for the listeners in Israel and around the world, to Israel Radio, I have tried to explain how the British public, but more important also the British government, is responding to events in the Middle East and trying to heal some of the rifts between the British government and the Israeli government where there have been problems in the past and will continue to be. That's the nature of the beast, unfortunately. Excellent. And uh, Jonathan, great to see you. And uh, many of our viewers will know you from your excellent appearances on uh, Jerusalem Dispatch, uh, ICJ UK. Uh, it's great that you're on the Middle East Report. Do you just want to give us an update on what you've been involved in, in terms of Israel through the ministry of ICJ UK? Yeah, and, um, it's great to be back uh, on the programme and great to meet Jerry. Um, yeah, it, it's just one of those things that you, um, I've been to the embassy um, recently uh, to see the, a 43 minute program uh, oh, regarding the atrocities. Um, and that was some shocking information, uh, but to be an advocate for Israel. Uh, been on several marches uh, around London uh, for Bring Them Home uh, to see the release of the hostages. Um, so as a, 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 an ICGA rep, uh, I've been very much involved in those uh, type of things within London and the Jewish community. Um, been invited to some of the Jewish events as well, um, which are purely Jewish, uh, which was a privilege uh, to go and see some of these things based around music uh, in um, North Finchley. So it's been an honour uh, to be as a Christian uh, supporting the country of Israel. Excellent. Uh, and, and Jerry, I mean, we, we, we were discussing the new Labour government and its foreign policy towards Israel and the Middle East, but we have to discuss the horrors of what happened on October the 7th because everything is being discussed within that prism because everything's changed. So can you share with us where you were on October the 7th? How did you become aware of it? Uh, and how are you after this huge increase in Jew hatred that we're seeing in this country and around the world? Sadly, I have a problem of sleeping at night and like all most nights, I'm wide awake four, five, six and seven in the morning when the first news came through of the attacks by Hamas into Israel. I was incredulous. I didn't believe it. It's being the Sabbath, it's difficult to phone most of the Jewish community because they are observant and do not answer the phone on the Sabbath. But the two or three people I could phone to alert them what was going on, I managed to say to them, be aware. And of course, all the news media outlets uh, had to scramble their students, uh, sorry, scramble their correspondents to go in to Jerusalem as quickly as they could to be able to report what was becoming a very serious scene. The saddest thing of all is that uh, Netanyahu and his government 
took their eye off the ball. And as will be found when a committee of inquiry starts, they will find that there have been major, major gaps in the way the structure of security for that border region was being looked after. Um, there are constant reports, which I do believe, that the two extremists in the cabinet, Ben Gavir and Smodric, insisted with Netanyahu that the troops not required on the border should move into the West Bank, what some people call occupied territories, uh, to protect the settlers who were putting up sukkah booths for the Jewish festival of Sukkot. Um, and they were persuaded, the government persuaded, to have enough troops there to make sure that Palestinian attacks on those settlements was minimised. That left the border area very, very much vulnerable. And sadly, as we have subsequently seen, and you've seen the video, I haven't seen it, I know enough about it, mm -hmm. that uh, Hamas and its troops from other groups as well just took advantage. There were reports of a lot of training beforehand and the Israelis ignored all the signals, signs of that. Who knows? Yeah. But it will all come out in the wash eventually. Uh, and, and, and Jerry, just share with us how you are um, being Jewish at this time with this rise of Jew hatred that we're seeing in the streets. And, and I think it's so important that, that, that Christians ask that very important question to their Jewish friends and colleagues because, yeah, it's an unprecedented time. So, so how are you and how is the community responding to this huge rise of Jew hatred that is literally unprecedented that we're seeing in this country and sadly around the world today? It's very, very disturbing. The government were very prompt in offering extra security more money to protect synagogues. Everybody was on full alert for the rest of the festival of Sukkot. And subsequently, you cannot now go to any Jewish meeting anywhere without having security. It's an issue, but thank God the government have been willing to subsidize the cost of that security. That's bodies, faces, camera teams, and everything else. I was privileged as part of the board of deputies to go to the Gold Command Center, just up the road from here where they survey with cameras all the demonstrations, what's going on at the demonstrations, who should be arrested, who shouldn't be arrested, might not arrest them the same day. But it showed the dilemmas which were taking place each alternative Saturday when the people were marching from the Palestinian side. Um, on the particular weekend I was there, interesting story, the swastikas were used on some banners and the police decided not to arrest, and they had a good reason. The gold commander told me that his wife came from an Indian subcontinent, and the swastika sign is used, I think correctly, by the Buddhists as a sign of their religion. I think it's Hindu, so I think it's Hindu. Hindu, yeah. right. Um, but he said, because of that, we have got to question before we arrest anybody, is that swastika being used for the purposes they think, or is it part of some sign of support? Very major difficult issues for the police to resolve. The Jewish community, though, in general, have been very, very concerned, but have been reassured by people in both major parties that the government and the opposition, now the government, are going to do the best they can to offer protection for our community. Excellent. Thank you for that update. Uh, and, and Jonathan, just share with us what it's like to be part of the uh, pro-Israel rallies, those rallies to bring the hostages home. And what is it like to interact with, uh, with the Jewish community in showing solidarity and support, not only for our Jewish community, but also for the one and only Jewish state of Israel? It's, it's very important that Christians uh, just don't talk about things, that they, there is a bit of action. <laughs> uh, faith without deeds is dead. Um, according to our scriptures. And so for me, it's so, so important that um, I voice my opinion and use my feet to go and demonstrate. Now, um, from a, a point of view, every demonstration I've been on, uh, there has been a thanks from the platforms 
for the Christians who are with uh, the, 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 the marchers uh, because they are so, so grateful uh, for people joining them in support of Israel, um, but also the hostages, uh, because there's still over 120 that we know of uh, that is still held captive. Obviously, we know that some are perished, um, but we want all of them back. And so uh, the Jewish community have been so, so grateful for the support that it's received from the Christian community that have stood with Israel. Yeah. Uh, and Jerry, how important is it for you and the rest of the Jewish community that you don't feel alone at this time, that there are Very Christians indeed. that are showing love and support and they are attending these big rallies uh, on, on behalf of Israel, that they are making their voices heard, that they are emailing and writing into their political representatives on the situation? It's been amazing and I should have mentioned it earlier, but I've seen letters from very senior people in the church write, written to say we are backing Israel as best we can. Um, we're not judging Israel what it's doing. We just want to make sure the hostages are released as quickly as possible. But more important, backing the attempts or countering the attempts by certain people to demonize Israel um, the language which has been used on some of the demonstrations has been horrendous. And the police keep on saying, we are constrained. We cannot necessarily act to stop what's going on. Um, we've got to have definite evidence it breaches the law. So we found lacunas in the law, which must be addressed, both by the previous government, who were looking seriously at changing the law, and the new government, which is very sympathetic, and will have to make their own judgments on how it's a balance between freedom of speech, which there has to be, and making sure that the communities are not frightened or scared, not afraid to come into town, to the centre of London, when there's a demonstration against Israel. Now, the demonstrators have used lots of devious ways. Some of them have broken off and done small attempts at spraying paint all over buildings. They've made life very difficult for some Jews who live in the centre of London to be able to go to synagogue on a Saturday, all sorts of things like this. And you can't patrol every single road and every street around a synagogue. It's very difficult. We have a marvellous organisation, Community Security Trust, and they have done wonders, mm -hmm. aided by the British government. They work in co hand, hand in hand with the Metropolitan Police to make sure that as best as possible, the police are aware what's going on. The most recent march the other day, the police actually made sure that the march would not go anywhere near any synagogue at all. It was a completely diverted away from Jew areas where there are Jews, so there would be no conflicts. But um, just to emphasise what you've said, um, where we've had support from the Christians and other nominated denominations has been amazing. Um, how much it's influenced the government, who can say? but the government have been very receptive to the idea that we have to make sure that Jews are not disadvantaged in this country and the levels of anti-Semitism have sprouted forth in all sorts of strange places, stickers on fruit in supermarkets, motions at conferences, all, all sorts of things which have been going on which we never expected to see, but it's happened in America, Australia and many other places. And the Israeli government also have got to think carefully when they take their military action of the ramifications for Jewish communities around the world. No, absolutely. And um, Jonathan, uh, on, on to the general election. So uh, we know that uh, Labour had a, a massive victory on uh, Thursday, the 4th of July, um, actually winning uh, 411 seats, and that's up from 219 seats uh, in the previous election, which was held in December uh, 2019. So share with us uh, your thoughts on this historic uh, victory for the Labour Party in this year's general election. Um, <laughs> yeah, congratulations to Keir Starmer, uh, because ultimately the people voted and uh, you know, it's great that we are in a democracy and it has been a real peaceful transition uh, from one uh, group to another. Um, obviously, for me, uh, when you see that Labour only got 34% um, of the popular vote, 
uh, with so many seats, liberals have um, come back into power. Uh, the left-right um, uh, groupings uh, are a lot closer than the numbers suggest. Um, also concerning for me um, is the independents that have stood in certain areas that um, are really uh, pro-Gaza. Um, so I don't believe that uh, Labour will have a, a, an easy ride. I think there's a lot of... Uh, groups within the Labour Party and we, I think we're going to soon see um, what they and what they are standing for to do with Israel. Uh, but they have a super majority as they call it in the press um, and they have now a mandate and obviously their mandate was very very clear uh, that uh, they want a two-state solution and they want to ensure that uh, as soon as possible the hostages are released and there's a ceasefire. Uh, they've not been quiet about that, they've been very, very clear. Uh, Keir Starmer himself, um, I think, um, has done very well for the Labour Party in, uh, in where it was back in 2016-17 with the previous um, leader uh, who was very anti-Semitic. Um, and I think he's done a, a wonders to the, do that. But there are still people in that party that are anti-Israel um, and it's going to be interesting how Keir Starmer and his team, his front bench team, are going to steer it through because some of the front bench um, have already um, been on demonstrations in the past, uh, pro-Palestinian marches, uh, they've said certain things in the press in the past, so it will be interesting how that front bench works uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Absolutely. Uh, and Jerry, you could probably tell, tell us how many general elections you've actually covered, but uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on uh, uh, the general election 2024 and why do you think that the Conservatives lost this election so badly? Oh, I mean, they lost it, the it, was, plot. it was like an absolute bloodbath. Yeah. It, they just lost the plot. The, you, you, the one thing you learn when you, as I do, sit in Parliament, in the reporters' gallery, a government doesn't find the hardest opposition in front of them opposition benches but behind them and the minute there's any signs of disunity a government starts to crumble and this government is no exception in fact it's much worse because you've got senior members even now bickering over the entrails what's left and arguing about their position for the future of the leadership of the Conservative Party but I give all credit to Sunak and to Cameron for standing by Israel in principle, over what's happened since October the 7th. But they have, in some ways, some people view, justifiably criticised some of the actions that Israel has had to undertake to finish the job, as they put it. And this is raising sorts of issues which is going to, as you've pointed out, mm -hmm. cause problems in the Labour Party. They lost five constituencies including the leading member of the party, Jonathan Ashworth, from getting his place in Parliament. Four other constituencies, they've elected people who are rooted, linked to groups associated, I won't say directly with Hamas, but certainly sympathetic to Hamas. And whilst those five MPs, and maybe Jeremy Corbyn as well, uh, don't have any power to change any Labour Party policy. Labour Party has got to steer a difficult course. Keir Starmer and, to give them credit, the Conservatives stuck to the same policies right through the election period. And Keir Starmer made very clear that he supports Israel's right to self-defence. He supports the right of Israel to look after its own people in the way they choose. But he did question sometimes the way Israel has dealt with it. The bigger problem is that the reportage of what's gone on, even today, is distorted by one small factor. That is that Israel, in my view foolishly, banned any foreign correspondents to work in Gaza. So the only correspondents working there are people in Gaza who are under Hamas, and have a camera or a voice recorder and can do whatever reporting they like. 
so we get distorted pictures and stories coming out all the time. The large number of deaths reported, you never hear how many of them are actual terrorists. You never hear how many of them are members of Hamas. You just hear a global figure, always of children and women. So it's terribly, terribly distorted. And as a result of that, nobody can have an accurate picture of what's actually going on from day to day. But, but just picking up your point there about no foreign correspondence being allowed in Gaza, is that not a good thing? Because if there were foreign correspondents in Gaza, they wouldn't have the freedom to actually uh, report the truth anyway. They would have to tell the Hamas narrative, otherwise their lives would be in danger. And of course, we know that from Israel's experience in 2014, the last time they had a major war and their major foreign correspondents, none of the Western media reported the truth. It was all reporting the Hamas narrative. Most of the time, but there are, were single occasions, very clear in my memory, where, for example, Jon Snow of Channel 4 reported as to what Hamas and Hezbollah were up to during that particular conflict and gave them a hard time. He was brave enough to stand and say, well, look, we've got the evidence. We can see the tunnels. We can see what the schools have been used for or what other things have been used for. Um, you know, there might be a hospital, educational facility and the like. And at the moment, there's nobody there to counteract anything that they say. And as a result of that, most people who are watching as impartially as they think they can, are going to say a plague on both your houses. Whether it's true or not, we don't trust what the Israelis are saying either. And it's been a very, very difficult job for those who are interested in finding out the truth as to what happened to actually see and find out for themselves based on A, what the Israelis say, or B, what Hamas said. And in the first casualty in war is the truth. Oh, and that's oh, yes. sadly been the situation. Yeah. Um, I would add one small thing, other, uh, other thing. People have read about the massive demonstrations in Israel. The country is split completely down the middle and vast majority of the demonstrators have one message. We want you to prioritize hostages, not the elimination of Hamas. And if Netanyahu had not succumbed to the pressure again from Ben Gavir and Smodrich, he would have been able to put more emphasis of getting the hostages out at whatever price than leaving them to fester as he's done. And sadly, so many have now lost their lives. Out of the 120 that there are believed to be, it's reckoned at least half are now sadly dead. Horrible. Yeah, just horrible. And uh, our thoughts and our prayers are, are definitely with the hostages. Please keep them in prayer. Keep the families in prayer as well. And uh, may the reigning ones come back. Um, in terms of Friends. I mean, we, we, we see that Israel has lost many friends um, and many parliamentarians that have stood up brave in bravery and courageously for Israel. What impact do you think this will have on giving Israel a voice amongst our parliamentarians in Parliament? Um, at this moment in time, I don't know out of the 411 um, how many are um, pro-Israel. Um, so um, as Christians, we need to be praying that um, there will be some that will really stand up for them. Uh, there is a, a movement called Labour Friends of Israel. Um, it has been quite a small group um, and it's very much in the party conference, it's fringe. Um, but out of, because they've got 200 plus more, hopefully that will become more of a, um, a well-supported group within the Labour Party. Um, and my prayer is that there will be one or two people who will really speak loud and clear. Uh, the Conservatives currently, they have Christian Friends of Israel too, and that has been a large group from the Conservative Party and it's uh, at party conference. Uh, it was one of the best attended yep. um, and best supported. Uh, so uh, Israel has lost at this moment in time um, in Parliament a, a group that really supported them um, I, I personally get emails uh, regularly uh, from these groups um, and my prayer is that Labour, uh, they won't go quietly, but there will be others added to that group at this 411. Absolutely. I hope you don't mind me saying, uh, no, you please. mentioned Christian Friends of Israel, it was Conservative Friends of Israel. Sorry, Conservative yeah. Friends of Israel. Just, uh, 
but there are two groups. But the Christian Friends of Israel have been major players, and the rallies they've had in Parliament over the years have been superb support Absolutely. for the Israeli cause. And I give all credit to them for the work they've put in, amongst many other groups who have been true to their colours and suggested Israel has got a case and it should be heard. Absolutely, and you were very much involved right. in the uh, ZDF uh, CFI uh, lobby day of Parliament, uh, and you'd uh, brief uh, delegates from both the Jewish and the Christian community to share what they should share with their members of Parliament. But as, as a, a decades-long correspondent in Parliament, um, Jerry, uh, what are your thoughts on Keir Starmer being our new Prime Minister? And um, do you think he has a Jewish wife that must have a big impact on me? He's already talked about how he wants to finish work on Fridays at 6 p.m. so he can have a Shabbat with him and his wife and his family which I think is very important. Does that bring a bit of reassurance uh, to the Jewish community knowing that and we know that before he has stood up for Israel but we know he has a tendency to flip-flop and change his mind if there's too much pressure placed on him. He doesn't flip-flop according to pressure that's not his style he's been robust superbly robust in eliminating anti-Semitism from the party wherever and whoever has been involved. Look what action he took about Jeremy Corbyn. It, take, uh, it took a lot of guts to fling him out and to stick to the decision. Um, Starmer is a hard-working individual. His work ethic is amazing. Um, and I'm saying this apolitically. He will prove to be a strong Prime Minister. He doesn't cave in to demands that easily. Um, yes, there will be pressures within the party to follow a more proactive policy towards the Palestinians. Some will be calling for immediate recognition. But in essence, he has carried on the same policy as the previous government and said only when it's the right thing to do. And that is listening to what Biden says or the next American president, so that they're all stepping in the same direction at the same time. What's been more interesting, and I draw people's attention to the stories which many Labour MPs have got to tell about how they were hounded during the election. Jill, uh, Jess Phillips, yes, yeah. prime example, where she had an anti-hate, really anti-hate Israel policy, uh, people nagging her, disrupting her campaign and she found it very very difficult because her life was threatened and many other MPs who were standing in constituencies sadly with high Muslim populations found it very very difficult to sweep back. 20 approximately 20 constituencies on the Labour side found themselves under such pressure. For, as we said four of them succeeded and got four in, is some people call Islamists. Uh, I think it's maybe a misjudgment of what you can call them, but they're certainly one issue candidates. And once the Gaza situation is resolved, no idea what they're going to support or not support. Israel has always been a contentious issue to the British public, and especially in Parliament. We've now got just one Jewish MP on the Conservative benches. We've got about a dozen Jewish MPs on the Labour benches. Not all of them are supporters of Israel as it's presently constituted. I'm not saying they want the elimination of Israel, but they don't particularly like Netanyahu and the policy he espouses. And they would willingly, many of them would be willing, see a new leader, a new leadership in Israel. Who's that leadership going to belong to? Who knows? But the pressure is now on Netanyahu. A, because he's got trials coming up for his activities, alleged activities, but B, when the Committee of Inquiry gets going onto this war, he will find it very difficult to sustain the position he's got. They're talking at the moment of the coalition breaking up because of the Orthodox and also the far right. Who knows where it's all going to go in the near future? Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. And um, Jonathan, um, what are your thoughts on this new Labour government and uh, the policy position that it will present as British foreign policy towards Israel and the Middle East? Do you think there will be a, 
uh, clear departure from that of the Conservative Party. Obviously, Jerry's uh, just uh, informed us that it looks like there'll be a continuation mm -hmm. of British foreign policy from that of the Conservative Party to that of the Labour Party. But of course, they're more precious on this Labour Party from the hard left and the Islamists within the party that, that want to back a unilateral Palestinian state call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza um, and those who in the party want to advocate that the Israeli Prime Minister and Defence Minister uh, face trial for alleged war crimes in The Hague. Yeah, it, it's, it is very difficult. At the moment, it, uh, Labour Party and Conservative Party were, were in agreement um, on a lot of things, including a uh, two-state solution at the right time, like Joey was saying. Um, and uh, that was very clear and, and it has been very similar um, I think the Labour Party, um, as it continues, um, they do have a disadvantage because obviously they're supported by unions and uh, certain unions have already come out very strongly um, to uh, come and support Palestinian and immediate recognition of a Palestinian state. Um, but I think Keir Starmer is determined at the moment um, and I think he's got a little bit of a breathing space with so many MPs um, to continue uh, in the same vein as the Conservative Party, where they will support Israel's right for defence. They will be very, very clear that they want a ceasefire as soon as possible. I think a lot of governments around the, country, um, the, around the world want to see Bibi uh, go. Um, statistically, um, Israel at the moment uh, they don't want to have an, another election at the moment, not during this crisis. Uh, but as soon as that crisis is over, uh, they do want to, to go to the polls. So uh, Bibi is, uh, is in a very hard, hard place uh, with the world around and in, even in Israel. Uh, with the right and left parties, he's trying to keep everything together, trying to win victory over Hamas, trying to bring uh, the hostages home. I wouldn't envy anybody to be in that place with so much pressure. Uh, and as Christians, we need to be praying for all the leadership um, in all the countries, including Israel. Absolutely. There's another factor which is a variable. Nobody can assess yet how the new British government are going to react towards Iran. Yep. Well, Iran's pulling all the strings. I'm going to come on to that one a bit later, if that if that's okay, Jerry, because I think that has yeah. that is uh, effectively the key policy. Whatever the British government or uh, this new government decides regarding Israel and the Middle East and the situation in Gaza and Lebanon, the issue of Iran has to be resolved, uh, and this is the most important foreign policy decision coming out of uh, out of uh, out of the foreign office but 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 share with us particular uh, calls because we see that there's a huge pressure from labor MPs from the grassroots labor movement to push for a ceasefire um, and we've heard David Lammy our new foreign secretary talking about such but but surely this is not essentially down to Israel but down to Hamas. Um, to actually then release the hostages, surrender, and then the war's over. Well, there are so many conflicting stories, and it's all posturing as to whether the current talks taking place as we're recording this are going to lead anywhere or not. And the last I heard, Netanyahu has put down four key po policy points, which Hamas definitely not going to accept. Whilst Hamas have made a slight movement towards the Israeli position, it, according to Netanyahu, it's still not enough. And they're saying that because of the pressure from Smodrich and Ben Gvir. And as long as he's bound by their policy pushes to keep his coalition going, his manoeuvrability space is very limited. There is a rebellion within the Likud ranks yeah. because there's nobody as a natural successor who's been allowed to develop any idea or identity. Uh, Netanyahu has got a very tight control over his party, but there are real concerns that once he, I won't say relinquishes his position, but maybe forced out, there's going to be a lacuna as to who can take over, who's acceptable, and who's acceptable not just for the Likud party, but all the other parts of the coalition who are finding uh, Netanyahu's positioning getting less and less easy to accept. For example, the religious groups. 
They have, until now, been with Likud. They're now being forced by a new law to provide students who are studying Torah, yeshiva students, to join the army. And many of them are certainly not in a physical f condition and probably not in a mental situation where they could do much in the army, but the, for, the government have legislated for them to join the army. And the question is how, what, where and when. And the religious authorities are fighting against that with very great venom. And it could be that it's one of the factors that will bring down the Netanyahu government. Interesting. So let's have a look now at this uh, very short video with our new Foreign Secretary, David Lammy, uh, talking about the new British government's position on Israel and the war in Gaza. Let's be clear that the time has come for the United Kingdom to reconnect with the outside world. And we have been very clear on that in the British Labour Party. I want to get back to a balanced position uh, on Israel Gaza. We've been very clear that we want to see a ceasefire and we have been calling for that since the end of last year. We want to see those hostages out. But when we see the tremendous loss of life, 38,000 people, women and children, the fighting has to stop, the aid has got to get in and I will use all diplomatic efforts to ensure that we get to that ceasefire. So that was uh, courtesy of, of the Times there. David Lammy, our new Foreign Secretary. Now, regarding David Lammy, uh, he's been appointed and uh, this new Labour government to be our new Foreign Minister. Now, having read his um, article that was posted on uh, the British and Foreign Office uh, website, where he's outlining his vision for British foreign policy under this new Labour government, uh, he did say, which surprised me a bit, that he, uh, he considered one of his political heroes Ernest Bevan, who was Labour's foreign minister from 1945 to 1951. Uh, and Ernest Bevan was considered probably one of the most anti-Semitic Labour ministers in history. Um, he presided over the most shameful period of history, the uh, latter mandate years, uh, from 1945 to the re-establishment of the modern state of Israel until the 14th of May 1948, where the Labour government prevented uh, Holocaust survivors who had fled the horrors of the Holocaust from entering the British Mandate of Palestine, the only place in the world that wanted to rescue and home Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. And then we see with stories like the Exodus ship that the Royal Marines boarded those ships and, and committed violence against those uh, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. Then they were sent back to effectively concentration camps back in Germany. Yeah. Um, and our, our history during this period has been absolutely shameful. So it's a little bit surprising how David Lammy would say that Ernest Bevin was one of his political heroes, considering the history of Ernest Bevin when he was Foreign Secretary. Uh, it, you know, it's always interesting when you read history and, and see um, somebody who quotes somebody else. Um, and obviously it is a shame of what the Brits did um, in uh, at Leeds, the camps there, um, and forced um, the exodus to, to not land. Um, for me, uh, I think Keir Starmer, um, over the last six, uh, since 2006, 17 was it? Um, he has done quite a lot for the party, but I think there's still uh, uh, something underneath that it won't take too much to bring to the surface. Um, I agree with you, Jerry, that he's done a, a real good job to um, keep so many people quiet, and it certainly has put the Labour Party on a different track. However, there is still people who have, uh, quoting, you know, from uh, the gentleman. Um, I think David Lammy, there's things in his roots uh, that will come up over the course of time. And I think from a foreign policy, um, certainly on issues like this, and obviously you mentioned Iran, that's a biggie. Um, and it will be interesting to see where it comes and what happened because the Middle East is a powder keg at the moment.
Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Jerry, um, talking about the new government's position, they say they're calling, they want an immediate kind of ceasefire. Um, this has been the discussion between Keir Starmer, our new Prime Minister, and the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, but effectively, by if Israel were to agree to a ceasefire now and leave Hamas, uh, the elements of Hamas in power in Gaza, doesn't this pose a huge threat to Israel's national security post October the 7th? And also the fact that the Israeli people themselves want Hamas gone from Gaza because they never want to face what was a sense another Holocaust again that happened on October the 7th. That's very much the case. Um, the real issue, when you come to the basics of it, as long as Netanyahu makes it a major priority to eliminate Hamas, there are many people, even in the military in Israel, and certainly the defence minister, who said, you can't do it. It's impossible to achieve. You can downgrade them tremendously. You can eliminate some of their infrastructure, yes. But to actually eliminate the whole of the Hamas movement, it's a mission almost impossible. And there is the root of a slight division between Keir Starmer, who has said yes to a ceasefire, and Lamy, who wants an immediate ceasefire. And those proponents of immediate ceasefire overlook the Israeli case for saying that gives eventually a success to Hamas. Because if you stop fighting halfway through, eliminating them, they're just going to spring back. Absolutely. And look at how many, sadly, kids have been orphaned. In 10 years' time, they're going to be raw material for Hamas. It's really serious. It's a major issue. And that's why there's so much dissension in the Israeli streets and the Israeli political system for a policy which has no defined end. It's easy to use the slogan, let's eliminate Hamas. In practice, it is physically virtually impossible. Now, I understand the emotion of the events of October were such that it's easy to say, let's get rid of them so they can't do it again. But reality shows, even just a week ago, rockets started firing again from the part of the Gaza Strip into Israel. They're unguarded missiles, but they still hit and they can do damage. And this is something which is not very clearly explained. If you listen to the reports on the BBC or Sky or anything like that, they will not report those missiles coming over the border on most days, unless there's a serious casualty list on the Israeli side, which is, thank God, really the date because they've got very good shelters. Mm -hmm. But because of that, all you hear about are Israeli fights against Hamas, where they're bombing one place or another place, where there's been people living bang in uh, cover for a Hamas military place, a military center, whatever it is. We don't know where the hostages are being held, on tunnels or whatever. The group that got rescued just the other day we're in flats. Nobody knows anything about that. It's a difficult one. It's very embarrassing for the Israelis not to be able to demolish the Hamas infrastructure. It's far too well embedded. But they're saying that, um, you know, when, when you hear some of the military, um, they're saying that basically they could have destroyed Hamas by now if the hands were untied. Absolutely. Because they believe that um, Biden and, and certainly EU, NATO countries um, have put so many restrictions upon them that they haven't been able to go in in the way that the military wanted to. And, and therefore it has delayed, in quotes, the success of yeah. this mission. Um, I agree that there will always be people who, um, in Gaza who will be favourable towards Hamas. Uh, but if you deny them weapons, which is what's happened in the corridor, um, if Egypt, obviously there's reports that Egypt are going to cooperate now and stop the uh, weapons coming in, but obviously they were complicit, really. They oh, knew what was going course, on. Course. Um, and so to stop that happening, um, stop them getting weapons, will actually... Uh, I think will ultimately defeat them. And um, as a Christian, my prayer is that there will be a rising of the people 
And, and I, yes, I get that a lot of Gazaeans support Hamas at the moment, but once they know that they are weakened uh, to such an extent, maybe there will be some um, groups that will rise up against Hamas. And there's beginning to be one or two outspoken. Some doctors have been outspoken recently. And sadly, there was news just a couple of days ago about a con alleged collaborator with Israel who was found almost murdered yeah. on the streets of Gaza. And that is what Hamas henchmen have got the ability to do. They frighten the local population. They make them really feel the pressure to comply with their instructions and it's all part of the system it's a fear yeah. fear based and yeah. and ultimately you know every one of us wants to see uh, palace you know cars are free um and the people living in uh, a peaceful place and israel living in a peaceful place I mean, my israeli friends say for example that gaza has the best beaches in the mediterranean why don't they turn Gaza into the kind of uh, next uh, Singapore? Why don't they invest in hotels? Why don't they invest in their beaches with nice restaurants and tourism, uh, which they would do very, very well. But we, we know that with, with Hamas in power, their only one aim is the total destruction of Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, and also the fact that Israel's having to face a dual military strategy, as you were saying. On the one hand, they want to eliminate and destroy as much of Hamas as they can, including the terrorist infrastructure, their weapons, their tunnels, but at the same time looking for the hostages as well. So it's a, an incredibly complex uh, military operation. Uh, and of course, Western governments haven't experienced what Israel experienced on October the 7th. They haven't had their citizens murdered and raped in the way that Israeli citizens were. So this needs to be uh, conveyed and this needs to be communicated. Um, but uh, Jonathan, in terms of the makeup of the Labour Party, we know that there are large elements of the hard left, including Islamists, who are totally opposed to Israel. Do you think they will have some sort of impact upon Starmer's stance towards Israel and his push for a Palestinian state? Um, I think ultimately, yes. I think Starmer, uh, Keir Starmer at the moment, um, you know, is standing strong, um, like the Conservative Party. I mean, you know, lots of people with David Cameron uh, were concerned when he became foreign, of, foreign minister, so was I. Um, and some of the ways that he spoke one to one group of people and then different yep. to another. Um, I think Keir Starmer is very determined to try and allow Israel to defend itself. But obviously the pressure for ceasefire and the pressure for two-state solution is going to just increase. Um, and it's how far he is willing to divide the party over. Uh, he's got a huge majority at the moment, so he's got a little bit of time but there will be pressure uh, to uh, immediately, like the Irish, to agree to recognise a Palestinian state from the 1967 borders, uh, which is crazy, uh, but that's another whole story. So, yes. Uh, and Jerry, I want, I want to talk about Iran because the latest kind of news coming out from Israel, and I've kind of known this since January of this year, um, that the next phase of the war is to take out Hezbollah in the north because 82,000 residents in the north are not going to go back to their homes as long as Hezbollah are on the border. Uh, we've seen a constant barrage of rockets and missiles, as we can see on our screen, uh, caused over the past eight months from Hezbollah. Um, and this looks like the next phase of the war. But also the Iranians said that if the Israelis go after Hezbollah in the north, uh, they will retaliate against Israel on multiple fronts and before we know it, would then would be sucked up into a regional war. What is the Labour Party's or the Labour government's position on Iran, knowing that Iran is the menace, Iran is the real problem, and you eradicate the Iranian regime from the Middle East uh, and certainly we'll see a massive reduction in yes. Islamist terrorist they attacks. They thought on it was possible to eliminate Hamas. They've got a very big shot coming with regard to Hezbollah. They are incredibly well entrenched in southern Lebanon. They are an army within an army. They have got rocket fire which can reach all over Israel. Probably not quite as far as Elat, but not very far short of. Certainly to Beersheba in the southern part of the country. Um, and Ashdod Ashkelon, 
which is very near the Hamas border with Gaza. So they've got firepower and massive backing from Iran. And, and Iran has got single-mindedly a vicious hatred of Israel. That's not going to disappear anytime soon. Um, their new leader has just taken over and he keeps on muttering under his breath and publicly, Israel does not be included, is not included in the peace deals he's thinking about. So he might be able to arrange something with America, who knows, uh, it could be, but he's not going to trust Israel whatsoever. What's more interesting, um, and I think we should watch with great care, is what Britain is going to do with the IC, uh, IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. Um, prior to the election, they were calling for them to be disbanded, eliminated, and called out for what they are, um, expelled from this country. That's not been repeated since the election. I know it's only a few days since the election, but David Lammy hasn't mentioned it at all. Um, if they were so dealt with in that way, it would show strong guts by the British government to take the Iranians full face on. The British government under Sunak decided not to take that action, despite a hell of a lot of pressure from Conservative MPs and many other MPs and others in the international community. They felt it was better to keep a door open, to have a ability to speak to Iran, even though it's going to cost them, um, rather than closing the international revolutionary guards down in this country and therefore make it easier to isolate Iran. Iran is still a very strong country. It's got ties now with Russia. Who knows what's going on with China? So it's going to be very difficult to visibly take down Iran from the equation. And Iran is determined, as the new president said yesterday, that Israel is still going to be what they call the Zionist entity, still going to be a major target for Iran. It unites their people and as such makes it easier for them to capitalise on supporting the Palestinian and Arab world. But note how many other Arab countries have come to Palestinians' aid besides the Iranians in the last few months? Only the Qataris. The, I would host. have a question regarding the Iran. Five minutes left. Yeah. Okay, because ultimately um, I've heard because of the low turnout that there's a lot of people in Iran that are not supporting the government and the Ayatollah. Um, and so uh, you made a statement that said that um, they've all, they're in favor um, of the government's stand against Israel. Um, my uh, sources uh, are saying something very different, uh, that there is a real movement against the Ayatollahs and, and percentages of people yeah. voting and turnout was very, very low. I hear so that. I'm concerned. Uh, just look back on all the different statements over the last couple of years when the women took to the streets. Later, there was the students taking to the streets. All these things peter out very quickly and the dissent in Iran is rowed back very, very fast. Yeah, so you can be optimistic and say this is going to be the milestone opportunity for Iranian moderates to show what they should be able to show. In practice, they have overcome. The Iranian regime has overcome one way or another, all the bits of dissent internally, yeah. Yeah. and fr frighteningly so, it's going to be much harder for America or any other country to do a deal with Iran. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we've got three minutes left of the programme, so I have to ask you, um, uh, Jonathan, as, uh, as Christians, how should we be praying for our new government and uh, to um, uphold the special relationship between Great Britain and the modern state of Israel? Well, it's, it's so, so important that we are praying. Um, as Christians, we have to pray for Keir Starmer and um, his cabinet. Um, the Bible tells us to pray for those in authority. We don't have to agree uh, with their policies and um, not just about Israel. There's several other policies that they want to bring in that should concern Christians um, and should concern humanity, actually. <laughs> uh, but at the end of the day, uh, God has called us to um, pray for them. Remember Cyrus, uh, he was an ungodly Nebuchadnezzar ungodly kings, but God can still use them. And so let's pray that God will still use Keir Starmer and his cabinet
for the further of God's kingdom here in Great Britain. Amen to that. And um, uh, Jerry, um, what role can Christians play, particularly as we have new members of parliament um, that have uh, just taken up their roles, having been elected on the 4th of July? How important is it that Christians engage with their political representatives in parliament on issues of Israel, but also the rise of Jew hatred in this country, so that they are aware of these issues and they're informed so that they take them seriously? It's a very simple equation. Lots of times MPs come up to me and say, we're hearing all the time from the Muslim side, the Arab side, the Palestinian side, and we hear occasionally from the Jews, but nowhere near enough. And that weight of letters, weight of emails, weight of policy questions being raised by the electorate is out of balance. <coughs> and it really is going to be I use the word mitzvah, which is a special word in the Jewish religion. It's a really good, kindly thing. If non-Jews as well as Jews responded to the circumstances we're facing today, just to send a letter in to MPs to assure them that there is general support for Israel, could they please make it vocal and show that Israel can and should be part of the modern world where it shouldn't be under attack? So, Jerry and Jonathan, thank you so much for being my guest on today's Middle East Sport. Both done a great job. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you for watching this programme at home. Yes, we have a new government. We have a new Labour government with a massive super majority. Um, we also know the pressures on the new government uh, internally with the uh, radical left and the Islamists. But we also have to pray that for the special relationship in terms of British foreign policy towards Israel and the Middle East. And our government needs to know that Israel is a light unto the nations. And it's important that our nation is blessed. It needs to stand with Israel. So thank you for watching this week's edition of the Middle East Report.